All right. Hello, and welcome back to another jam-packed episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin, and joining me today is an ER doctor, and Dr. Judson Korn. He is an inner circle member. He is an avid hammerhead and an enthusiastic crusher of weakness, and how could he not be? He lives in Montana, which I think we can all agree is the manliest of all states, and I say this as a very proud Nebraskan, uh, Montana, I, I definitely... I give them the crown that they most surely deserve. Plus, Harrison Ford lives there, as I recall. So I think uh, that is also worth something. We're going to be talking about his origin story. We're going to be talking about some of the really cool feats that he has achieved over the last uh, roughly about a year since he's been uh, doing some of my programs. And also get some insights into how a guy with as busy and hectic of a schedule as a dad and the ER doctor can manage to not just stay fit, but keep hitting PRs left and right. So he's going to give us some great insights. And uh, on that note about hitting PRs and crushing weakness without crushing yourself, if you have not, you should get my nine-minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge. As the name implies, it is only nine minutes long, and they are not the kind of moves that are going to get you an appointment with Dr. Korn, meaning these are uh, gate pattern style movements that are going to help you to imbue your body with the strength and resilience that it's supposed to have. A lot of people tell me that if they've improved their, their military presses, their squats, their pull-ups even, and of course their overall resilience just from doing these movements. And it's designed to be done with your regular training. So it's also not the sort of a thing that you've got to put your training life on hold for. So if you're interested in that, check it out at nine minute challenge.com. It's totally free. It's the number nine minute challenge.com. So without further ado, Judson, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, um, I am very curious about your origin story because you and I have done some uh, consulting in the past. We got a good chance to uh, learn a little bit about uh, our respective past, but I am especially interested because I think everybody is curious about a couple of things. And one of them, is what life is like if you're a doctor and you're treating patients. And as an ER doctor in particular, you see stuff that, well, people would expect, I guess, to see from like that show ER from, you know, back in the nineties. Oh yeah. So when we, we'll get to that point eventually, we'll start with a little bit, you know, a little bit easier, but uh, what is your origin story? Now, I know you live in Montana now, and that's a very rugged mm -hmm. outdoorsy kind of place. Did you grow up kind of uh, with an outdoorsy, rugged, like very physical upbringing, or was it, uh, maybe the opposite of that? Uh, no, it was pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Lots of time outdoors. I had asthma and allergies really, really bad as a kid. So I spent a lot of time, um, recovering from running around outside with like come inside and my face is all swollen and I can't breathe. And I'm, you know, taking, having to take a bunch of asthma medicines and things like that. So um, I remember like my, one of my first memories is being inside like an oxygen tent in a hospital. Um, and so I think I had a uh, little bit of a disadvantage at that. I really wanted to move and wanted to be outside and do all these things, um, but had trouble with asthma and allergies. I think I got on great medications pretty early. And so I was able to, uh, to manage it and overcome it uh, pretty well. And yeah, my father was um, he would just take us outside all the time. You know, we didn't go to church or anything like that. We would just spend time in the outdoors, uh, in the woods and hiking. And we would go on hours walking through the woods as a family and then we'd go canoeing in the river and, uh, fly fishing and things like that. And that was kind of, that was kind of how I grew up and got introduced to skiing as well uh, at a really young age. I think I have a picture of me on skis at two and a half years old with my arms like stuck out to the side because the suit is too big for my arms to go down at my sides, just like a uh, Christmas story. Um, yeah. And that was, that was kind of how, how I grew up with things. Now that to me sounds like a story worthy of a future president. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, he was basically a very similar story. As I recall, he had asthma growing up and his, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it was his decision or his dad, but he, he was also very outdoorsy and he ended up, as you know, you know, becoming, uh, a real icon. Um, now, you, maybe you weren't swimming the Potomac, you know, in, <laughs> like he was, but nevertheless, canoeing and all that other stuff, uh, I'm sure did something to help uh, with your with your asthma. Did you find that as time went on, you were able to sort of overcome it? Or was that the sort of a thing that uh, took some different intervention? I think, yeah, I mean, 
actually, I started swim team when I was maybe in fifth or sixth grade, and we do that for a few summers. There was no, there were no indoor pools where I grew up. So in the outdoor pools, you can only do it during the summer. But I think that, um, you know, essentially breathing discipline that you have to do with swimming, uh, that helped my asthma a ton. That was one of the first things that where I noticed a, a huge difference. Um, yeah, and then um, that was, and then otherwise just figuring out how to manage it um, for the most part. That's very cool. It makes sense too. You know, I never really thought about that, but yeah, if you're going to be swimming, you're going to have to learn how to breathe efficiently, how to mm -hmm. uh, breathe for performance. And, you know, that's really the essence of anybody's fitness. You know, like if somebody's very strong, but they get winded walking upstairs, we see that as a, as a very obvious handicap. When you mm -hmm. found that you're, when you started doing the swimming more regularly, um, did you find that you had kind of like a renewed enjoyment of uh, physical training? Like it didn't feel like it was as hard anymore. You'd hit your stride. Yeah, I think, I think it was some, some point around then that I figured out like I could swim really hard and get out of breath. Like that was kind of the point when during the competition, I think it took yeah. me a couple of years to figure that out. And I remember going into like the divisional tournament and I was kind of like in the bottom and I was in the last the last group of swimmers to go. And I like just all of a sudden decided, well, I'm going to try to swim fast now. And I, you know, I made it to like the, not the final round, but somewhere close, but somewhere a lot further than I had been in the past. And that was really exciting uh, for me. And then about that time I started playing soccer pretty intensely, like twice a year, uh, two seasons a year in sixth or seventh grade. Um, and was always, uh, always did really well at soccer and had a ton of fun. And, uh, you know, I think the asthma just became manageable at that point. So I was able to, you know, maybe run around for a few minutes, wheeze a little bit, take an asthma inhaler, and then I was, I was set. I was good to go. Nice. And I think um, soccer really taught me, I think being a, a smaller person, not not terribly small, but compared to other people, not as big and, and maybe a little faster, but really taught me how to use my weight a lot when people are trying to tackle you and you're kind of moving your shoulders differently and, um, and that that yeah served me quite well so I think that was where I really started maybe taking off athletically um yeah and then I did a lot of winter sports like I started snowboarding about that time and me and my friends we thought we were really cool we we're always like building jumps and trying to do tricks and flying through the air and hurting ourselves but having a lot of fun while we were doing it and uh yeah so I think probably around that time that was when I really discovered I just love like moving my body and doing all these fun things that is awesome. I, you know, I have to say too, you probably already know this because you're a, a, an enthusiast for training and all that other stuff, but you had like the ideal childhood for somebody who wants to grow up and, and do and be great things in terms of like the, the physical side of things, because I, a big mistake that a lot of parents now make is, you know, they want to get their, their kiddo into like a select soccer team. So they try to get him uh, or her to play soccer year round, but mm -hmm. it's the multi-sport and multi-activity uh, kids who ultimately uh, over the long run are the ones who are more likely, I mean, it's still extremely unlikely, but uh, more likely to end up being able to play professionally at, at the maximum, but at a minimum, they have just kind of better all physical development and uh, better body awareness. And it sounds like, mm -hmm. you know, in addition to overcoming the asthma, the fact that I, I would, I would venture a guess that you and I are probably roughly the same size because I was also, you know, kind of a scrontonimo growing up. And mm -hmm. uh, so you learn how to overcome and uh, how to make do with what you've got. And so you had that the two sided thing with asthma, as well as being, uh, we'll say normal sized. Because if you leave America, mm -hmm. you notice people generally, well, you and you have, you notice that people are not necessarily always as massive, unless you're in a Nordic country, you know, which case, yeah, just <laughs> exaggerated for sure. And now, um, so I'm curious this early, uh, your early experience with physical activity, sports seems like it set you up pretty well. Were you, did you start getting into like strength training and, and weight training, like in, in high school? Is this something that you did much later in life? What's the story there? Uh, yeah, I never, I think I remember having just a handful of memories of like trying to go with my friends who played American football and try to bench press. And that was laughable uh, from my effort. You know, I tried, I, I think, and I think I remember trying to drive my car after doing a bench press for a little bit and I, I couldn't, my, my pecs hurt so bad. Um, I couldn't move my arms at all. I was like, no, nah, this isn't for me. Um, you know, but I, I knew that I was lacking in strength there. I felt like my legs were strong and my lungs were was good. I was athletically fit, but did not have, have strength like that, which kind of then, you know, that's why I probably gravitated towards those other sports. 
Um, but uh, always kind of had them back in my mind that something like that was lacking a little bit. I didn't really do any training until, let's see, sometime in medical school, I realized that, you know, I can't get outside for hours at a time all the time as I get older. I think I got away with it in high school. I got away with it in college. Um, you know, in college, I shifted away from soccer and just did a lot of outdoor things, was hiking and mountain biking a lot and started rock climbing. And then once like school got really serious with medical school after college, um, <clears throat> I realized I just, I can't go away for hours at a time. I was living in Seattle and it's like a minimum hour and a half drive to get to anywhere uh, to do that. And so I just, I don't have five hours that I can just kind of do uh, spend those time on those activities. So I got a program from this gym out of Jackson Hole called Mountain Athlete. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I think it was military athlete and mountain athlete, but um, I got a dry land ski training. And that was my first introduction to really weight training and doing things in the gym to prepare myself for, for outside. And I remember the workouts were pretty intense. They were like 45 minutes to an hour long, five or six days a week. And I was able to pull that off in between classes, but, uh, and it worked wonderfully. You know, I deadlifted for the first time and had, you know, basically didn't have any back pain. You know, maybe like I had had aches and pains or something like that before that all completely went away. Had some issues with pain in my feet that all completely went away and realized how, how amazing that was. Um, and then I went skiing with some friends and I just skied them into the ground. Um, and it was my first day of the year and they were all both also medical students really busy. And they were like, no, we got to stop. We got to stop. And I was like, really, we can keep going. I'm feeling great. And that was the first, you know, aha moment with, um, with strength training that this can really fuel me for what I like to do when, especially in a lot of times in my life, I'm like a glorified weekend warrior. Um, but being able to do that in a healthy and safe way and sustainable way, and then still able to not just struggle while I'm out there, but have fun and enjoy myself. So that was, the, that was my first introduction. No, that's great. You know, and I, I think it's a, a great story about uh, something that people don't realize. You, you put it very well by calling it an aha moment, because I think a lot of people are like, well, why should I do strength training? You know, because I like to hike, you know, or I like to ride my bike. My legs are pretty strong or, you know, uh, uh, this, that, the other thing. And those are all excellent activities. But as you pointed out, it's like your strength training helped you to get better at the stuff that you wanted to get good at. And so I think mm -hmm. people have a tendency, uh, at least initially, to compartmentalize the stuff that they like to do uh, as being like an either or sort of a, a thing. Like, well, either I can enjoy skiing or hiking or, you know, mountain biking or, or whatever it may be, or I can do strength training. But the reality is that if you're doing it right, they should complement one another and they should help you Absolutely. to build, you know, uh, skills uh, one on top of the other. And um, so then the ultimately the question comes to how, when and how did you discover the kettlebell specifically? Was it from the, mm, mountain, yeah. the, uh, the program you were talking about earlier? Or was this a later thing? Uh, it was later. Yeah. I, th I don't think there were any kettlebells involved in that program that I did, but just that sheer time commitment was just not manageable. Um, especially then when I went from medical school to residency and I'm working, you know, I had my first child at that point, really busy at home, working between 60 and 80 hours a week in the hospital at all hours and just, you know, had no time. I think the first two years of residency where I didn't really do anything and uh, tried to do some push-ups and pull-ups and things like that. And then tried to mountain bike as much as I could when I had time off because um, I could sneak in like two hours and so that worked out where I was living. Um, but I would always hurt afterwards I was just in pain especially my lower back it's like oh my god my back hurts and uh one of my friends ended up I think he had read from one of his friends about um uh simple and sinister and that was exactly that's how I started so I think I borrowed a kettlebell from him or at first I had a 20 pound dumbbell that's what I was doing swings mm -hmm. with and get ups you know all self-taught so I'm sure my technique was horrible mm -hmm. um and eventually bought a bought a kettlebell or got one from my friend, I think a 24 kilo and started working with that and yeah, went on from there. Um, actually, no, it was not a 24 kilogram that I started with. It was definitely 16. <laughs> that would have been the hardest weight that I could manage at that time. Um, but just amazing how I felt. I think especially Turkish getups were such a revolution of, you know, moving my body under tension and in, in strength. I had done a lot of yoga before, but that, you know, 
and that was excellent. And I still do some yoga. I feel good when I do it, but I, you know, it's not, it's missing that strength component um, or that weighted strength component that we should say that, that really helps, you know, with all the other activities that I do and just helps me feel better day to day. And yeah, so, yeah, that was the first time it was sim uh, simple and sinister. I, you know, it's funny. I got to tell you, we have sort of parallel stories, maybe a few years apart because my first experience with the kettlebell was very similar. A friend of mine introduced me to it and he loaned me one of Pavel's books, one of his earlier books, uh, Enter the Kettlebell. And he loaned me a kettlebell. Like you and I must have a personality <laughs> that just allows us to have friends who are like super generous. And like, because yeah. that's a like a great thing to do to a but I, I would like never loan a kettlebell to anybody. So yeah. I'm glad that I had a friend who was willing to do that. And um, so you're doing uh, Simple and Sinister. You started mm -hmm. doing swings and get-ups for the first time. You ended up getting your very own kettlebell. And what made you say, okay, you know what? I want to, I really like this kettlebell business. I know there are a lot of other exercises and other programs. I'm going to, I'm just going to like branch out, see what's out there. Was your goal to get stronger, to continue to feel better, uh, improve your endurance? Like, like what was on your mind? I think it was all of the above really. Um, it was just, let me get, yeah. I mean, this seems really cool. Um, I feel like I feel better. I move better. Um, you know, I'm able to generally kind of maintain a level of fitness that allows me to enjoy mountain biking at the time was what I was primarily doing and hiking. Um, and so just like, let me just follow this. Um, so right before I left, uh, in, in Arizona, I went to a kettlebell gym one of the, I don't know, Danny Sawaya was the oh, owner of that yes. gym. Yeah. One of the original, yeah. Um, the OG. Strong first. Yeah, exactly. And I took, both my wife and I took a, like a, just some lessons from him. And uh, it was amazing. I think it was just um, to finally have someone direct my form. I mean, I hadn't, all of the stuff I'd done up to that point was all self-taught. So not good. I mean, I'm probably I'm very lucky that I didn't get away with any injuries from doing things incorrectly. Um, but yeah, I had a few lessons with Danny and then, uh, ended up then moving back to Montana and I think it just got a little stale with S and S, you know, it was the same movements the whole time. And I knew there were so many other movements out there. So I wanted to try, um, I think I went to write a passage after that and did some, did a lot of pressing and that felt good, but just kind of always wanting to do more movements. I just never felt like there was enough movement for me that you know stretches that hits the full variety of movement that i like mm -hmm. and that also i know that that fuels me in the mountains you know when i'm fall over when i'm skiing and trying to get up and then if i'm like you know going through a corner on a mountain bike and having to lean this way and there's just so many complex movements uh, having a heavy pack and walking with that all day um so many different movements that i didn't feel were covered that i kind of felt like we're covered in those other programs i was doing a lot earlier but that took a whole hour of my day. So yeah, I was constantly searching basically from there. I think, uh, my next step was, yeah, my next step was I found, um, Al Chiampa on mm -hmm. strong first and joined his online gym. And it was interesting because it was only snatching and then running. We would do like low cardio, um, low heart rate running, and snatching and that was great i got really strong with it i'm super thankful for that i think it did build an aerobic base but i don't think that it really helped me with those other activities that i was doing probably carrying a backpack that that must have helped i just didn't feel that carryover that i wanted i think um and that i was you know continually searching after that i spent about two and a half years doing all those snatches went from you know 24 kilogram you know doing sets of um, 30 sets Say 30 sets of five reps with the 24 up to, I think like I got up to probably 24 sets with a 32 kilogram doing five reps. And, um, but it was always just on the edge of ah, my shoulders are a little tight. My neck's a little tight. Um, you know, I don't feel like I'm really hitting my leg strength, uh, as much even with the running. So, and then it was just, I was, I was overtrained and that was my own fault, but mm -hmm. I was overtrained at that time too. I was, and I was, yeah, also right when Okay, we had a brief snafu there. I believe we are back. Uh, you were saying that you were doing the uh, snatching protocol. We're talking about mm -hmm. um, your mountain biking and other things, and then we lost you. So I'll have you go back and uh, okay. mention what you were saying again. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I was working, um, you know, doing snatches for a really long time, got up to, you know, higher and higher weights and and generally felt good. And I think it built it built a really strong kind of base level of kettlebell fitness to where I, but I, I kept wanting more and it just didn't, it just didn't fill in those gaps that I, that I kind of sensed were there. But I you know, just had this idea that, you know, just this one movement, it's not covering everything. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of the people that were in that same program had had a longer history of weightlifting or yeah. kettlebells and had done all of these things where I hadn't, I just kind of had gotten there and it felt like, I'm building bricks and they're great, but it's just, there's, there's holes in the foundation and I need to go back and fill things in. Totally. Yeah. Um, it's kinda, I know the feeling it's sort of like, <clears throat> like you jump into the deep end of the pool. Cause you see how like everybody else is hanging out there and then all right. of a sudden you're like, Oh God, you know, like I probably should have, you know, waited in a little bit and the, in the shallower end and made my way over. So yeah, I believe me, exactly. I've never done that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then I think I kind of floundered for a little bit trying to figure out what I wanted to do and, did a, you know, two thirds of a program here and half of a program there. And, and then, um, oh, so, but I have to, have to point out during that time when I was snatching a lot, you know, it, it really helped my kettlebell fitness of the kind of standard programs. I mean, I did the, I've done the, uh, snatch test a few times without a problem. I think the first time I did it, I actually, or no, every time I've done it, that was the very first time I saw you with your article on strong first Mm. from years ago about the double breathing and then how you, um, how you train for it, doing your higher, the higher weight and doing sets of, you know, five and then sets of six and sets of seven on the minute to get yourself prepared for it. I did your program for, I did that for maybe three weeks, two weeks, and then did the snatch test. Um, no problem. I mean, I was exhausted, wiped out, but you know, got through it, got the hundred reps in, in five minutes. That was all nice. I was going for. So, um, then I was with my test weight, the 24 kilogram. And then I also, during that time, I was able to kind of do a similar program with swings. And then I did a simple standard, I think they call it now, right? I was able to get simple. So the 100 swings in five minutes and then the uh, 10 Turkish get-ups in 10 minutes with, with the 32. So that was exciting. Um, you know, so I, I knew that it was working, but it just, I don't, I didn't feel the translation into the things that I will like the reasons why I got into it in the first place. And that's, I think I've read that a lot. Like I think it is attributed to Dan John, but keeping the, keep the goal, the goal, Mm -hmm. isn't that one of his sayings? And I think my goal has always been to augment my outdoor activities. And I think that at some point with the snatching, I realized it, it was not doing that anymore. It was augmenting my kettlebells. um, But it wasn't to the point where I could go out and perform the way I wanted to in the moment, essentially. Yeah, I you know, I remember there was a, a very well known kettlebell instructor some years back, and he pointed out, for instance, for athletes, um, there is a point at which strength training is no longer as helpful, and that you just have to focus on. Uh, and this again, this is for competitive athletes. Uh, you'd have to focus on like maintenance because the amount of work that it would take to increase your strength beyond a certain point requires specialization, and then you're not keeping the goal the goal anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I think that a lot of my experience has been with it. A lot of people, what they want is uh, they do want maybe specific things like, let's say, hit X number of push-ups or, or pull-ups or whatever, whatever it may be. But above and beyond that, they also want to be able to do a wider variety of things. They don't want to find that they're like lacking. Like now I can do a bunch of push-ups, but I can't do a single pull-up. Or mm-hmm. you know, now I can do a bunch of pull-ups, but my shoulders hurt. You know, people want to feel good and perform well. And the best approach seems to be filling, you mentioned this earlier, filling in gaps, like identifying mm-hmm. them, filling them, and then, you know, making sure that your training is reflective of that while, as you, as you noted, keeping the goal, the goal. Um, and then um, eventually at some point or another, it sounds like you, you read my, my article uh, mm-hmm. through variety, through the magic of the internet, you probably yeah. up on my, on my email list. And then you mentioned doing day of the deadlift yes and uh, so i did that was the first program i bought from you i saw that and i remember reading the article on strong person i was like oh yeah that's the guy i did that snatch program from that was really smart that was awesome i was able to do the test after that um <laughs> and so i picked it up and you know i think i used a 20 kilogram uh kettlebell and did the you know i think it's five days a week for three weeks and did the the deadlift program and just I was, 
I, I was hooked at that point. I think I just, I felt really great. Um, I, I could tell the, I could feel the crossover to mountain biking and to hiking and running right away instantly. Um, and, you know, I hadn't really deadlifted since I had deadlifted with a barbell years and years before, because you don't do that in many kettlebell programs. They show you how to do it. It's kind of like part of the introduction, but you don't, there's no programming with it that I've found really. Um, and especially the single leg um, variations or just how, you know, you're going from center and to side and then the kickstand and everything just really hits all sides of your, you know, your posterior chain. And that was amazing. Uh, and then, you know, I think I read in there at the end, it's like, well, what do you do now? Well, you know, try to take a few days off and try to try to do a press. And so I, I had pressed the 32 kilogram bell, I think I, once or twice um, after doing a kind of brief peaking program in which both my shoulders hurt like crazy. Um, it just, you know, I did it and I was excited. And then I'm like, put it down. I'm like, oh my God, okay. Rub my shoulders and, you know, got it finished. And I didn't press for months after that because of pain, because it hurt. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I would go back and try to press the 28 or even the 24 and they were not pain free. I was like, all right, I'm not going to press again yeah. for a while. Um, and then I had done your deadlift program uh, and picked up the 32 and was like, well, I'll give it a shot. And just went right up both sides. And I was like, okay, this is amazing. <laughs> I hadn't been pressing. I hadn't done any, you know, I hadn't done overhead kettlebell stuff in a while and it just went right up, which then I'm not, you know, 32 is, is a, a lot of weight for me. I think it's, it's not quite, I think 36, probably I'm between the 36 and the 42 for a half body, uh, half body weight press, but it was, you know, that's the most I've ever put overhead. So I was excited. Yeah, that's, no, that's especially awesome. And this is a good example too, I think of uh, the value of specialized variety because you mentioned you know the the deadlifting variations that i had and there were not there, there was the standard sumo deadlift but i also included mm -hmm. some uh some variety that would help to kind of make sure that the other muscles that that have to do their job when you're deadlifting or swinging that they're actually getting involved and um yeah it's it's awesome to hear that uh number one you've got a lower body movement that had such an impact on the upper body because even i wasn't mm -hmm. you know like I, I always like to hear these, you know, the what the heck effect stories. Yeah. It's like, I never know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I tell people to test because it's like, <laughs> you know, like when you fill gaps, like a lot of great things happen. And, uh, and that is an especially cool one because, uh, you know, a heavy press is something that typically you have to earn with a lot of pressing. And in this right. case, you earned it with a lot of really relatively light deadlifts. So I, yeah, we're onto something there. And that, that was fantastic. I think, you know, because you read everywhere. It's kind of dogma, like, oh, you can't shoot a cannon out of a canoe. And so you really have to build the way that you set up for a press is so important. And that's all true. And I agree with that. But this was a specific way to build that base um, that I hadn't found anywhere else. And that was like, OK, boom, I'm hooked. I joined the inner circle right after that. Very nice. Very, and I think yeah. you, you mentioned uh, before the call, you joined it around 68. And I know that from there, mm -hmm. I had a couple of uh, issues that you went through and uh, really enjoyed. I remember getting some emails from you. Uh, yeah. Refresh my memory. <laughs> what were some of the, like, the early insights that you got from those, those issues? I just remember being energized and excited about my training again because it was doing new movements. And I was, um, I, yeah, I just, you know, I think the, single exercise sessions that I used to do a lot of, you know, they would still leave me with energy, but um, I just felt more energized after doing your, your uh, inner circle workouts. And then I would, I, my, my body felt more connected. I was able to just hit everything and it just, it just felt better all around. I think it gave me an energy boost and I was excited. You know, I was excited again about training because there were so many different, so much variety. Um, I loved all the, and I still love all the squatting and lunges. I think those are some of my favorites, especially because they're so, you know, relative to what I do uh, or what I like to do. And, you know, I hadn't, hadn't done those in, in too long. I think it's very, yeah, very I'm, exciting. Now I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that too, because I do think that, you know, there's something to be said about doing uh, programs that only have like a very narrow focus. And uh, I think over the long term, you can still get a lot out of those, but you do have to sort of rotate the focus. And, and over the, mm -hmm. the, the zoomed out view for most people is that they're better off uh, getting reasonably good at a number of different movements, because then what they find is that they get more of these what the heck effects where all of a sudden they're, you know, 
lifting more. They're doing stuff they hadn't previously, you know, thought about doing and, uh, you know, just defying gravity in, uh, in no shortage of ways. Yeah. Um, speaking of which you, you sent me a really cool video recently that I was like, I, I wasn't completely surprised by it, but I was, I was never, because it's, I've, I've heard of other people, uh, having, you know, similar, uh, effects. I'm not going to give it away because I want you to be able to tell the story. Um, okay. but, uh, tell us like the, you know, the run up, like the, the challenge that you were doing and then what you decided, like on a whim, you're like, I'm just going to give mm-hmm. this a shot and you know, yeah. You it. yeah. Um, so doing the crawl days challenge right now, which I'd never done, but I was you know thinking, oh yeah after going through looking at your website and all the shop and things that I can buy at different challenges after doing a few of the other OS exercises, I realized like, this is amazing. I think go back briefly to what you said about what things I like from the inner circle. It was just, and above and beyond uh, above all that was the combination between the kettlebells, the body weight and the resets. Um, you know, I'd messed around with OS and just kind of, I read maybe Tim's first book. Um, and I've been doing some of those things, but with again, zero guidance. And so it wasn't that effective. And the way that you combine that into your programming just gives me so much more better movement base and more you know, freedom. And it just makes me feel better in general, the way I move and things like that. So anyway, I think I did crawl days and I've been doing all the workouts as written, which is, I mean, if there's a day without a baby crawls, oh my God, I'm I'm smoked like this. It's hard. I had set a timer for maybe three minutes and then I have to, I'm like go crawling by the timer. Come on. When is the three minutes up? So very challenging, but excellent. You know, I feel great afterwards. Um, I think it was day 14 and I just, I, I think I finished the workout. I was done for a little bit walking around the house and I'm just like, man, I feel really just connected. I feel like everything, like my shoulders are connected to my heels. Like I'm just solid through the middle. And I was like, oh, isn't that sort of what you, that's what you want with a one arm push up is that connection feeling. And so I think I leaned over on my counter and I, I know how to do the sort of belt uh, height and hip height um, one arm push ups. I've read it a little bit, never have, I've never trained them. I've never really practiced them other than just looking how quickly I flop onto my face uh, when I try them because they're so hard. So I did one and it felt really good. And I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to give it a shot. And in my bedroom, I got in the appropriate position and um, I went down about three quarters of the way on my right arm and came back up. And I was like, well, I've never been able to do that before. So then the next day, um, I think I looked at some technique a little bit from a, a, a friend who knows how to do them. I spread my legs out a little bit further and just like dropped down and got all the way on my face, almost to the ground, came right back up with my right arm. I couldn't reproduce it on the left, but I I was still pretty excited, you know, no training whatsoever and doing a one-arm push-up. I I, I tried them, you know, years ago and I was like, this is not in my wheelhouse. That was what I thought. And I did it without training it. So that's incredible. And, you know, I think you've stumbled upon, uh, and and telling the story really touched upon something that is overlooked by a lot of people who are chasing after the one arm push up is that that sense of connectedness. And so a lot of times the uh, progressions for the one arm push up, their intent is to get not just the connectedness, but then attach the technique to it. But anytime you want to get good at something, you need to have a good fundamental base for anything. And this is true for like any skill. And it's easy to forget that when you're really, really focused on like one arm push up. You're like, I'm gonna have to do, you know, the one arm push up uh, progressions, and it, it's a good idea to do that. But um, if the main goal is to, if you if you have a reasonable amount of, amount of strength and you've got uh, the the dedication to do something daily, like crawling, as you pointed out, a lot of times people end up stumbling into it, and then they realize, well, now I know so much more about my body positioning that when I do really start working on it, I'm going to make much faster progress. And that's a, a very cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, just the, the crawling every day. I mean, it's, it's challenging and it's, it's certainly a challenge. Uh, oh, yeah. There's no, no minting words with that one, but uh, I, I love it. I think the, it's funny. I, mean, I think it really just exposes where gaps are. I think I've always felt like, you know, within this crawling position or, you know, with, push-ups and things and my, my strength is maybe a little bit lower than I'd like it to be. Um, and the crawling just 
he's amazing for that. I think the hardest for me is just the forward leopard crawl or Spider-Man crawl. Backwards crawling somehow is easier. Um, but yeah, and just, and then the sideways crawl is ridiculous. Like yesterday I did the all sideways crawling day. And yeah, I, my midsection is feeling it for sure. Oh but, yeah. But in a good way. I mean, I woke up this morning, I feel fine, ready to go. Um, but enjoy it a lot. That's great. And that's one of the, that is one of the nice things about crawling is you can feel completely annihilated. Like when you're done mm -hmm. with your, your training and then you wake up the next day and you're like, oh, I feel like a million bucks. I can, I can do yeah. this again. Exactly. Exactly. Even after working late last night. So yeah, it's excellent. Now, yeah. um, the one final thing to mention that I thought was, was cool is that you'd mentioned to me that one of your goals was to get to 10 pull-ups, which is, I think mm -hmm. is a, an excellent goal for any serious strength enthusiast. And I know you haven't tested it recently, but we did a consult maybe a couple months ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember if was it, maybe it wasn't on the consultation, maybe it was afterward, but you got pretty close just by, by giving it a whirl. Yeah. I think it was before the consultation, you were asking about goals and I was running through things and thinking about what I wanted to do. And, you know, pull-ups I've always struggled to do three between three and five is always been my maximum since mm -hmm. Maybe I was like a scrawny 18 year old and I could still do 10 of them. Um, that was kind of probably my baseline way a while ago uh, okay. when I weighed like 135 pounds or something. But uh, <laughs> the so before our consultation, I thought, oh, maybe I'll give it a shot and see where I'm at. You know, I hadn't done rows ever. And I've been doing a bunch with your inner circle programming, doing all these different you know, style of push-ups as well, which I love, like the incline, decline, all the different variations that you have into the programming. And I went to my garage and I mean, I hadn't done a pull up in months and I banged out eight in a row um, with good form and I was very excited. So I think that, yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried it in a while and haven't been, you know, training it, but I've been doing a lot of rows and was able to go to the full body weight row. Um, I think I also sent an excited video to you at some oh, yeah. point over the last few months. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to use your power, power up the pull up program and see where I can get with that. Um, I'm very excited. Yeah. I went from, you know, years, I, I think I tried a couple of the strong first, like the fighter pull-up program and a few of the other ones. And they just were too much, like it's too many reps and, you know, pull-ups are a very particular, I mean, I think for everyone, but for me in particular, very fatiguing, mm -hmm. uh, movement. And, you know, I only have so many in the tank and if you can do like the different variations that you show that allow you to do up to, you know, 10 reps, um, you can really feel, feel a difference. Big time, so, big time. Yeah, I, yeah. I think uh, the the big thing is that the back strength in general is is huge, and a lot of people make the mistake of being like, "Well, I'm going to start with pull ups since that's the goal." But when you start moving, uh, when you start working on other moves, like you talked about doing a lot of rows, I'm sure that there were face pulls, you know, uh, tossed in there <laughs> periodically. A lot yeah. of times, that's kind of what breaks the you know, the, the impasse as it were, where you're kind of like stuck in this limbo of like three to five reps, like in perpetuity. And then once you start to like fill in those gaps that you've, that you've accumulated, you know, uh, unintentionally, all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, you know, now my body just knows what to do. I don't, there's no fighting mm -hmm. anything. It just sort of happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to, to going for a new PR with that. I, I wanted to tell a story too, though, about, um, you know, I love your, your email. I think I've had this, seen this a few times, but you have your ER or uh, PR or ER yeah. uh, titled email that came out recently. And it reminded me, you know, there's, you know, I think about what, what I really want in my training, you know, I want to do all these things that we're talking about, but I also really, I don't want to be injured doing training, right? I, if I'm injured while doing an activity, when I'm in the mountains, that's also a bummer, but you know, it may be a little bit more acceptable, but it's really not acceptable for me to get injured while I'm doing my training. But, yeah. you know, in the ER, I've, I've seen so many people that overtrain and come right in, you know, certain box gyms and strategies that they have of, of having people lift with a barbell to insanity amounts. Um, you know, I've had to admit young people to the hospital for rhabdomyolysis where their muscles are breaking down and damaging their kidneys um, because they've done too many of whatever repetition of, of, of weights that, that their trainer has them doing. So, you know, I've, I've seen that a lot. So that really hits home when you send that email to, you know, in a jovial kind of way about uh, ER or PR or ER. So I have a, I have a lot of experience with that one. So be careful of the, be wary of that, that trainer who makes you just feel really sore. 
Yeah, it, I, Pavel is like to say, you know, any any idiot can make you sore. It takes a good coach to be able to actually make you strong. And so I would I would echo that for sure. I think it probably is going to resonate with people more coming from you because you, I don't see these things. You know, it's just outside my pay grade. But the fact that you see people coming in who are a little too overly enthusiastic with their training um, definitely yeah. helps. Hopefully, will help keep uh, people to keep things in perspective in terms of you know like. You really need to do like that many more reps. You need to add that much <laughs> weight. Wouldn't make exactly. sense, to kind of, you know, work your way into it. Um, you know, now I always like to make the joke too, like you don't want to be paying for your physical therapist or your surgeon's uh, next year model Mercedes or something <laughs> like that. Um, but given that you have seen stuff like this, you mentioned the rhabdomyolysis that people get where the, again, where the, where the muscles are breaking down and damaging the kidneys. And yeah. maybe turning their pee funny colors. But we don't mm -hmm. we have exactly. to go into details, but the people can probably use their imagination. Um, what are some of the gnarliest things that you've seen in the ER pertaining to? We won't go into like you know gunshot wounds or anything. Yeah. We'll, like we'll stick with <laughs> exercise in particular. We don't have to talk about any specific you know uh, fitness methods or anything like that. But just like somebody slipped, fell, or, you know, did something silly, like apart from the rhabdomyolysis, what are some other crazy things that you have seen exercise wise? I guess exercise wise, maybe it's a little bit tame. I think it's mostly just the simple things of people like, oh, I lifted too much and now I can't move my back. Um, or, you know, my arm really hurts. I think, you know, sometimes you can get, I haven't seen it personally. I think a partner just had a case of compartment syndrome. Um, so all the muscles are wrapped in fascia, you know, it's that layer we all hear about. So if you're on a foam roller, you're releasing the fascia. Sure. And so it's kind of like this coating that sits around all the muscles and they're in these little compartments. And sometimes if you work a muscle too hard, or if you have an injury to it, it, um, it swells up really big and it cuts off its own blood supply. And it's like a very big emergency. Um, and you need to have surgery to cut open the fascia. Um, and that happens too, from these like really high rep things, people are pushing themselves, you know, they're taking a bunch of supplements or something like that to jazz themselves up and, and they do way too many reps of something and come in with compartment syndrome and need to have emergency surgery. You know, it's like just the complete opposite of what, um, what I look for in training. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm very glad that you're not looking yeah. at <laughs> sort of thing. Cause I, I wouldn't really even, I wouldn't even know where to begin to provide it, but I know that people especially it seems like a lot of people who are really into training um they some of them are doing i'm my friend and colleague uh mark rifkin i don't think he would mind my saying this that um he said you know some people are training to win championships some people are training to get healthy some people are training to kill demons meaning yeah. <laughs> not like you know they're right. gonna go like you know constantine you know like that movie with keanu mm -hmm. reeves that sort of thing but rather you know they've got They've got issues. Personal and, demons, yes. Exactly. And then that's their kind of their way to um to to work through them. And I think that there are probably better ways than, you know, the having the demons win by jacking your body up when that's kind of yeah. the, the you know, but um I'm sure you could you could share a ton of these stories and I'm sure that they could become very graphic and gruesome, but we will spare the listening <laughs> audience of uh, all the details. But in the meantime, if anybody out there is interested in following you, do you have social media where you post information about your training or uh, anything like that? Or uh, are you uh, planning on doing anything? You, the answer doesn't have to be yes, obviously. I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> but I think yeah. if, people are, if people are interested or they're intrigued, um, if there is a place, I would be glad to send them to that because I think it's great to see doctors who take not just uh, the medical profession seriously, but also health and fitness. So um, generally, no, I'm not really that type. I think you'll see me sporadically on the, on your um, private Facebook group. Oh, sure. Posting things like, especially, you know, I'm doing the challenge right now and I think it's a good way to motivate. I think, you know, yeah, I, that's the only reason I still log into Facebook every now and then. So, but I'm not, I'm not a big social media person. Um, and uh, yeah, so checking in there, and uh, throwing out various uh, random comments while I'm on on Facebook. That's uh, on, in your in your group. That's that's about it. Great. Well, that's a great. Point but I, I will say one more one more accomplishment that um, you know that I didn't talk about uh, yet, or I don't think I told you about. But I just came back from a backcountry ski trip last week. We were mm. um, had to snowmobile into this yurt that was about seven thousand feet, and then from there, there's all this skiing that we have to do. And 
it's all climbing uphill and then skiing down. And I think um, I went last year and I was uh, the last person up every single climb for the, the whole three days. And uh, this year I was like basically the first person up almost every time. Um, and I've been able to put more time in on the skis, but I attribute all that also to just better, better ground training and having better fitness and feeling better, more balanced and having, you know, able to um, have recovery at the same time. And that's what I love about the inner circle too, is, you know, you kind of bring it up a notch and then you dial it back down and have your recovery week. Um, all of that stuff has just been essential for me, I think, to, to continue to fuel some fun, you know, backcountry and different adventures. So I think that's we climbed, awesome. climbed 9,000 feet in three days. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I laid on the couch afterwards when I came home for a day, but you know, so I didn't feel terrible. So very excited. That's super exciting. Well, I'm very glad you told me that because, uh, I always love to hear stories of how, you know, the, the inner circle or any of my training helps you to do something outside of just the four walls of your, your training space so that you can actually get into the great outdoors and conquer it like never before. And it certainly <laughs> sounds like you have been doing exactly that. So I know that as of the time of this recording, there is snow on the ground out in Montana and you have probably got to hit the powder so that you can continue to show mother nature that you will not be defeated and that uh, <laughs> there are ever higher climbs that you'll be making when, uh, in the very near future. So, uh, I want to just take a second to say thank you for coming on. This is a, a really awesome podcast. No, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, flattered, but and I appreciate it. So thank you. My pleasure. And, uh, eventually we'll have you back on, you know, when you're knocking out the one arm, one leg pushups with ease and <laughs> you know, you're, uh, doing all sorts of other cool stuff. And, uh, folks, if you are listening, uh, join the Hebrew hammers hidden hideaway. It is just look it up on Facebook, uh, join it and you can check out, uh, some of the stuff that he is up to. I believe that his video of the one arm push up is in there too. So if you are curious, I think so. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend that you check it out. It was, uh, it was an awesome video. I wish I had gotten my first one armor on, on video. I just didn't have the presence of mind at the time to, you know, click <laughs> record. It just, you know, and I had a flip phone, so it wouldn't have mattered. It would have looked like it right. was filmed with a potato anyway. So well, if I didn't record it, you know, would it have even, did it even happen? So, uh, mine yeah. very well may not have, you know, like if <laughs> it's, I'm the only one who was there. Like I could just yeah. totally be making it up for all anyone's concern. I I'll swear that I did it night and day, but uh, you're right. I, I just, <laughs> I have no proof and you do. So, uh, definitely check it out in the Hebrew hammers hidden hideaway. Uh, Judson, thank you for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Alex. Take care. It's been a pleasure. And folks, as always, have fun and happy training.